pour moi, c'est extrêmement important ce qui s'est passé là. Tonight, provincial ministers in Quebec hear from Algonquin Nation chiefs demanding a five-year moose hunting moratorium. We are shut down, and people will listen and do their best like they have in the last how many months. We go to Rankin Inlet, Nunavut, to see how the community is combating COVID-19. This is the first time, never done before, that the Denny Nations are actively pushing the housing corporation. We want to work with them. And in Yellowknife, the Denny Nation tries to tackle rising rent costs. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. We begin tonight in Manitoba where jails continue to deal with COVID-19 outbreaks while family and advocates are criticizing the province's response to contain the virus. One Ojibwe mother says that her son was put into solitary confinement after testing positive. Brittany Hobson explains. The family of an inmate at Headingley Correctional Centre says the province's response to a COVID-19 outbreak at the facility is appalling. Sheila Yellowquill says her son was put into what is described as the hole, or solitary confinement, after he tested positive earlier this month. It hurts. It hurts to see my own flesh and blood, my own son treated in that manner just because he had to reach out for help. Yellow Quill says her son started exhibiting symptoms last month. When he requested to be tested along with the other inmates on his block, she says staff rejected that request. The family filed a complaint with the ombudsman. He was eventually tested and found to have the virus. And then he was put into solitary confinement. Yellowquill believes this was done to punish her son for speaking out. You don't segregate. Well, you do segregate, I mean, isolate, I should say. Um, but segregation isn't the answer because it's a form of punishment. Yellowquill says her son was only allowed out for a half an hour a day to shower and make a phone call. Advocates say this response is not limited to Manitoba. An institution in Calgary started doing this last month. Consideration for people's mental wellness has just totally been thrown out the window, right? Quinn Soretsky is the executive director of the Elizabeth Fry Society of Manitoba. She calls the use of solitary confinement an inhumane practice. If you look at, you know, putting somebody in that kind of an environment when they're extremely ill um, and exhibiting the types of symptoms that we see with COVID, um, with absolutely nothing to entertain themselves or to occupy their minds and their time, um, we're looking at creating um, really traumatic experiences in people's lives that are entirely preventable. A spokesperson with the province confirmed inmates who test positive are isolated, but would not say whether solitary confinement is used. Nahani Fontaine, justice critic for the NDP, says the province's response so far is unacceptable. She has called for the province to assign an independent investigator to witness the conditions at Headingley and report back. Send people in, send folks that uh, understand the system and can provide those recommendations on what the government can do immediately. As of Tuesday, November 17th, there have been 218 cases at Headingley, with 86 currently active. Brittany Hobson, APT National News, Winnipeg. Record number of COVID-19 cases are being reported across Canada almost every day. Manitoba has seen over 100 deaths since the beginning of November. On Tuesday, the province announced that 38-year-old Jennifer Garson Sinclair from the Fisher River Cree Nation was the youngest person to die from COVID-19. Sinclair died Monday. She had underlying health issues, including a hole in her heart. Sinclair had previously battled and beat H1N1, Manitoba's top doctor says every death is tough to see, no matter the age. I mean, all of all of the the deaths we announce here are, um, you know, are tragic, right? Right, uh, that we see, uh, but especially when you see a, a young person um, uh, die of this virus, it really um, uh, we all need to take that moment of pause. So there, you know, there were some underlying conditions, but. Um, uh, but still, it's uh, it's really tragic when we uh, when we look at um, you know all of these deaths that we're we're announcing every day here now. But uh, you know, especially when we when we see such a young person. 
In the House of Commons today, the Prime Minister was questioned on his government's stance on systemic racism, following another accusation of mixed treatment and neglect of yet another Indigenous woman in a hospital, this time in Ottawa. Lisi Kahaksik came to Ottawa from Nunavut to treat a broken pelvis. In the hospital here, she was denied water and staff refused to change her diaper. She called 911 and emergency services brought water to her room. This strong Indigenous woman said, we're done, we're not going to be treated like this anymore. First Nations and Inuit health is a federal responsibility. And this is another example of the racism Indigenous people face in the health care system. Indigenous people are done with racism, Mr. Speaker. When will the Liberals be? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, systemic racism against Indigenous peoples or against uh, racialized Canadians continues uh, and is something that this government uh, is committed to fighting against. We made a commitment and are moving forward on distinctions-based health legislation uh, that will uh, ensure uh, that we are doing a better job of supporting Indigenous peoples through their health challenges. We will continue to work hand-in-hand -hand with them and ensure uh, that through provincial systems as well, there is better treatment for Indigenous peoples. Meanwhile, the city of Ottawa denies the allegations against the hospital. Well, moose season has come and gone in Quebec, and the Algonquin Nation is still waiting on this season's kill numbers. For years, they've asked for a five-year pause on moose hunting in the Phonic Reserve, uh, encompassing their communities. The province's Indigenous Affairs Minister says he's ready to listen. Lindsay Richardson has more. Hunting season may be over, but negotiating for the future of moose in Quebec's Lavarandre Faunic Reserve is just beginning. Earlier this week, the chiefs of the Algonquin Nation sat down with provincial ministers, again repeating their demand for a five-year moose hunting moratorium. Quebec, however, says they're offering other solutions in the meantime. It's extremely important what happened there, Indigenous Affairs Minister Yann Lafreniere said of the meeting. On est en mesure hier de lancer cette négociation ensemble pour trouver une solution à la chasse à l'orignal. Quebec hired a mediator to oversee these official talks. The province saying it wants to find lasting solutions to avoid a repeat of the situation experienced in the fall. Everybody thinks it's the natives that are blocking the road. The Algonquin's decision to block access to trails in the Phonic Reserve sparked a weeks long saga of harassment. Sport hunters saying they paid for the right to cull a moose. The Algonquin communities in and around La Verandre are food insecure and rely on this seasonal hunt for sustenance. A lot of our people have faced a lot of discrimination, slur words and whatnot uh, throughout the, the fall. Uh, and, you know, um, and for us uh, to work with the Quebec government and for Minister Lafreniere to reach out directly a couple of days after he was uh, nominated for the seat, you know, that shows very good faith. Verna Polson is the Grand Chief of the Tribal Council that represents Algonquin in Quebec. With moose numbers declining, she says they're still pushing for a moratorium. It's going to be a, a quite challenging process, but, you know, like like I mentioned before, we've been ready a long time. You know, this this discussion needs to take place. And now that we have a minister that who's willing to push this forward uh, and sit down and actually sit down and have the conversation and start the negotiation, which is fantastic on, you know, for the Algonquin Nation. The protest camps came down in mid-October after a judge granted an injunction order filed by a hunting outfitter. To smooth things over, Quebec offered to refund unused licenses from the season. But outfitters in the area are claiming hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost revenue. After Monday's meeting, the province announced it's postponing the random draw for hunting licenses until March 2021 as a show of good faith. Quebec is hoping for consensus. The Algonquin Nation says it's too early to guarantee it. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. Traditional foods under attack in many regions, for sure. Well, we need to take a break, but still ahead. Nunavut fought the good fight, keeping COVID-19 out for many months. How did they do it, and how are they coping now that the virus is there and spreading? They were being quite uh, proactive. 
And that's a good thing. It's always better to be proactive to a problem than reactive. Welcome back. Rankin Inlet is home to around 2,800 people and the hub for community, uh, hub community for Nunavut's Kivalik region. This is where the area's health center, cargo center, and sporting center are all located. As part of APTN's perspectives on Nunavut's COVID-19 response, our Kent Driscoll traveled to Rankin Inlet before they had any positive cases of COVID, and he found a community that takes things into their own hands. Here he is in Rankin Inlet. This sign is the first thing you see when you arrive in Rankin Inlet. They're known for hockey here, but they're also known to be very active volunteers. And when COVID-19 hit Canada back in March, people here did what they always do. They tried to help. They even took courses on how they're going to, about 30 people took the course on how they're going to um, handle these infected uh, people. And like 30 people is a lot for volunteering. They were being quite uh, proactive, and that's a good thing. It's always better to be proactive to a problem than reactive. So uh, I commend them for what they did. Harry Tautungi is Rankin Inlet's mayor. His town council began meeting after Nunavut locked down and closed schools back in March. When faced with the unknown, they made a plan. We had meeting up after meeting, and it was getting a bit much, but we reacted, not panic. That was one thing that we, I, I and we kept bringing up, let's not panic about this, like, let's just deal with it as we're told to do, deal with it. And on top, people went over that to uh, get together and help out. Mark Wyatt is ranking in Let's Fire Chief. He also coordinates emergency response for the community. Those meetings led to Wyatt's actions. Well, we set up isolation hubs. We had the arena earmarked for a temporary field hospital if we needed to. Um, a plan with volunteers to man those hubs. Pretty much everything. The, uh, but the challenge up here, obviously, if COVID did come with so many people living, I mean, I know houses that have 20 people in them. This is one of the longer roads you're going to find in Nunavut. It leads from Rankin Inlet to the Melodine Gold Mine. The mine is usually full of southern workers in Nunavumu from Rankin Inlet. When COVID-19 hit Canada in mid-March, days before the government of Nunavut locked down the territory, a plane load of workers arrived in Rankin Inlet, headed to the mine. People from Rankin work at that mine too, so they were worried about the spread to the community. Residents blockaded the entrance to the mine because they didn't want potentially infected people in town. They just decided to take into their own hands to to handle it and I don't really blame them and uh, I think uh, they might have had uh, um, got the mind thinking to find a way to how do we deal with this we better do do, do this the best that we can and, and I, I think they actually did it. That led to all of Nunavut's mines developing a policy where if you live in Nunavut and work at the mine, you stay home and collect 75% of your salary. That way, no spread to the communities. There have been cases of COVID-19 at Nunavut's mines, but no spread from mines to communities. George Hicks was territorial health minister at the time, and he's now finance and justice minister. He points out there was a fairly big flaw in that plan. The plane had already landed. Uh, you know, I remember when that circumstance happened that they closed the mine after a, a plane had landed with a crew change and the crew was trying to get to the mine. Well, if they turn back from the mine, where are they going to, where's the left to go but into town? As of November 6th, Rankin Inlet has positive COVID cases. Before the first case hit, we asked Mayor Tautungi how the community would handle a positive case. If it happens, I think we'll shut down. And people will listen and do their best like they have in the last how many months, been six months or so. So I think, I don't know, it's like we always had every meeting we had, we're annoyed, but we might as well listen to the doctors and people who are running the, sh not the show, but the, the COVID situation. With the new positive cases, 
the hockey rink is closed now, but it still isn't a field hospital. COVID-19 is in Rankin Inlet, but the people here have been preparing for that since March. Rankin Inlet is shut down, as per the plan, and the rest of the territory is waiting to see if Rankin Inlet's planning can help prevent spread to more communities. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Rankin Inlet. Always enjoyable to see the sights up in the north, although a pandemic isn't a good news story, of course. Well, we have to take another break, but we'll be right back. Welcome back. It's not time now for our photo of the day. Thanks to Monica Buchanan, our very first three-time photo of the day. This peaceful scene of the Stelico River located in central British Columbia. It's lovely. Thanks to Monica for another great moment captured and shared with us. We want all of you to share your beautiful photos with us. You can do it by uh, emailing share at aptn.ca. Be sure to include all of the relevant details, the who, the where, the when. Uh, maybe your photo will be our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, we got minus two and rain for Fredericton, minus one and some snow for St. John's. Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus five and snow. Kujawak Sunshine, and minus seven. Get Saguenay, minus four and snow. Same with Quebec City, minus or plus six, but mix of sun and cloud for Montreal. Toro 12 for Toronto, sunny skies there. Sault Ste. Marie, some cloud and 11 degrees. Minus one and snow for Sioux Lookout, minus four in Big Trout Lake. Minus 8 in Sunshine for Norway House, minus 11 for Puckatawagan and Thompson. Snow and minus 2 for Winnipeg and Brandon, minus 4 in Snow for Dauphin. Minus 3 in Snow for Regina and Swift Current, minus 5 snowing in Saskatoon. Minus 6 is for La Rage and Buffalo Narrows, unless there's some sun and some cloud. Minus 13 in Snow for Uranium City and Stony Rabbit. Heading over to northern Alberta, we got minus 16 and sunshine for a high level, minus 7 with a mix of sun and cloud in Fort McMurray. Minus four and mixes a sun and cloud for Calgary, two for Medicine Hat, mostly sunny. Penticton sunshine and seven degrees. Quinell minus one, but mostly sunny. Six and rain for Prince Rupert, minus 16 and sunshine for Fort Nelson. Minus 33 and sunny for Dawson City. Whitehorse minus 19 and cloud. Wati minus 22 and clear skies, minus 23 in Norman Wells. Tuk Tuk Tuk, minus 16 and clear. Saks Harbor snow, minus 13 degrees. Whale Cove, minus 17 and snow. Arviet, minus 21 and snow. Kenite, minus 5 and snow. Joe Haven, minus 25 uh, and sunshine. Talioak, minus 26 and clear skies. Rents have gone up and vacancy rates gone down in the capital of the Northwest Territories. Charlotte Moore Jacobs met one young mother trying to find a home. Shania Smith Lafferty is trying to get ahead in a city where housing often holds people back. Lafferty and her two year old daughter Hazel live at Lynn's place. Oh, thank you. A YWCA wow. apartment building for women needing safe housing and yeah. stability. It was a relief because as long as I had somewhere to go, I didn't want to be homeless. I didn't want to be homeless with my daughter. 21 and a single parent who's still getting her footing. She was evicted from a market rental apartment in October, but accepts responsibility over the noise complaints she says she acquired when allowing family from out of town stay at her place. As soon as he told me I was getting evicted, I cried and I regret it every single time I had allowed everyone to just step over me. To Before that, the apartment building burned to the ground in 2018, which saw her and her newborn lose everything. And finding an affordable permanent place to live is challenging. It's pretty expensive to live in the place of only known as home. So I've been looking at like all these places that are like down south in like Edmonton, right? And I'm like, holy man, that's like a four bedroom for 18. In Yellowknife, $1,800 is a steal of a deal for a two bedroom apartment. According to the latest Northern Housing Report by Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, the proportion of Yellowknife residents with affordability concerns has doubled 
in the past decade and now hovers at 29 percent. Vacancy rates fell as well, showing limited options for anyone moving to or within the city. And in the communities, it's even worse. Dene Nation has reviewed the last two scathing Auditor General's housing reports. They've submitted a proposal to the federal government asking for direct access funding bypassing the GNWT. It always has been the housing corporation and the communities. But then the nation, you know, had made some attempts in the past, but it hasn't really taken off. And uh, this time, this year, this is the first time, never done before, that the Denny Nations are actively pushing the housing corporation. We want to work with them, but we all have our own ideas, we have our own concept of indigenous housing. Part of the proposal is to build 100 homes in five years in the 27 Dene communities in the territory, housing that would help Lafferty's family in the Klicho region of the NWT. But in Yellowknife, Lafferty is working to get off income assistance. I don't even want to be away from my daughter for three weeks, but that's like all I really could do right now. Because whatever, I, if I were to be working here and just getting paid like eight to nine hundred dollars every two weeks, that's like not even enough to cover like rent and you know. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APT on National News, Yellowknife. On In Focus today, we dedicated the show to our foods. We got incredible tips on cooking wild meat. And what are some of the foods that have been proven to be growing here for millennia, long before settlers claimed to have introduced them? Here's a clip. The foods that, that uh, have always been here, uh, uh, salmon and bison and deer and, and that sort of thing. Um, but people tend not to know that if it weren't for native agriculturalists uh, of the past, that we wouldn't have things like uh, spaghetti sauce, and uh, and we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't get to enjoy our mashed potatoes on Thanksgiving Day. Yes. Um, yes. And then there were other you know um, uh, indigenous crops from the Americas uh, provide now about sixty percent of the of the cash crops worldwide, and so in a very real sense, uh, native agrarians uh, uh, feed the world, and and people people don't realize it because we do take it for granted. Traditional foods to me is like the wild game, uh, elk, moose, deer, buffalo, slow roasted over a long period of time. Basically you roast it until it falls apart, you tear it up, put it on top of a piece of bread or bannock or fry bread, put it all together and eat it. And it's, you know, that's, that's soul food. Our friends at Feast Bistro and Cafe here in Winnipeg also created dishes especially for our APTN audience and walked us through those making dishes at home. You can check it out on APTN News Facebook page uh, or grab the recipes from aptnnews.ca slash infocus slash indigenous dash cuisine. <laughs> Lots of comfort foods on there for you using our favorite country foods. Well, I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night. Go eat.